These views are of the individuals and not the views of Campbellsville University. So welcome to Challenging Chats. This is the first one uh, in the university's history. And today I'm excited that we have Dr. Marino and Milan Bailey. Uh, and I'm just introducing them. Milan is going to moderate the conversation. And uh, we're excited to have more of these moving forward in the future. And so I'm going to turn it over to Milan. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about, I guess, we can start from I guess the beginning of the conversation, which would be um, the election. So um, I would like to start talking about like the voter suppression that we saw over the summer with the election and um, specifically also Stacey Abrams, um, her work that she did and how it helped to uh, kind of transform the voter suppression in Georgia and if it could work in Kentucky and also what it could take to work. Like what it would take to work. Now it's a loaded question, but we can break it down. Yeah, I'll start kind of with the middle because um, pretty amazing what Stacey Abrams has been able to do in Georgia. So for those of us that maybe haven't heard of who she is, she's a, a politician from Georgia, a, a um, African American lady who ran for the governorship just a couple of years ago. Uh, did not win the governorship, but had a very it was a very close race and she came close to winning. And so since kind of losing her her campaign for the governorship, she's been very active in organizing at the local level, getting people registered to vote and then getting them to show up and vote. The outcome of her efforts was to see two Democratic senators win in Georgia and to see the state also go for Joe Biden instead of Donald Trump. In other words, Stacey Abrams helped push Georgia into the Democratic camp. Whereas usually we think of the South as at least in recent decades as more leaning uh, conservative and more leaning Republican. So that's quite an accomplishment to move a state from one side of the spectrum and shifting it a bit towards the other. So she definitely created a campaign that I think a lot in the Democratic Party are going to be looking at to see if they can replicate in other places. And that goes to your second question about, well, or your, I guess your last question, where else could this be possible? And I think it's a great question. I think we'd have to look at uh, other states that have similar similar demographic trends as Georgia. And um, I mean, what we're seeing in Georgia is an increasing African-American population, especially in the urban areas. And the rural areas tend to be more uh, conservative, tend to be more white. And so I think any state that kind of has that sort of demographic balance is a possible state where Abrams, uh, her plan could maybe be implemented. Kentucky might be one of those states. We see similar patterns. The urban areas tend to lean more diverse, that rural areas are more, uh, are more white, more conservative. So it's possible that her strategy could work in a place like Kentucky. What's, do you have a sense about that, Milan? Yeah, thank you. Um, the next thing, oh. Um, yeah, I mean, what she did was incredible. Um, I don't think there's ever any, been any um, anything like it in the election results that we've seen so far. Like, a, like you said, Georgia is known to be a mainly Republican state and then for it to um, turn Democratic so fast and thanks, all thanks to her work. I think it also shows how important um, and how instrumental black women have been in right. the election process and, and just in politics in general. Um, and that's also leads me to my next question, which I was gonna ask you about the Biden administration and um, how he's trying to increase diversity in his cabinet. Um, so I guess my question is like, would that really work to change anything or do you see it more as a um, kind of like a front? Well, I think, so Joe Biden's been in office for a long time. He was elected, I think, in 1972 as a senator. And so he's been in the national spotlight for, you know, five decades plus. Um, it seems like a lot of his close advisors tend to be uh, leaning more towards white men. Um, and so people have noted that, like much of his close advisors tend to be white men. But at the same time, he's, he's put in place the most diverse cabinet in history. 
obviously with Vice President Kamala Harris as his uh, his running mate, and then obviously she's now the vice president. Uh, if something, you know, heaven forbid, something were to happen to President Biden, she would step in and become president. And you see other examples of embracing diversity. And you mentioned women of color in particular. Um, but I think of like his communications team is, I think, made up of, of largely women. Um, so I think what we're seeing in the Biden cabinet is a dynamic playing out in the Democratic Party as a whole. It's still kind of led by white folks. But the party is also, over time, becoming more and more diverse. And people of color are going to start expecting that they're going to have you know, more of a say in what the party does that reflects their, their balance within the party. Um, and, but, and but what do you think about that issue of, you mentioned like Stacey Abrams being a woman of color. Do you feel like the Democratic Party is becoming more open to, to women of color in, in positions of influence? Um, I think I think so. I mean, you see Cori Bush, obviously, mm -hmm. um, she's a big one. Um, when you want to talk about like women of color in higher positions, and like you mentioned, Kamala Harris now being the vice president, that's huge. I think it's definitely moving um, towards towards getting away from the stereotypical white man and getting more into like women of color and what um, all that they've done for the country and they continue to do. So, yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, so I guess we can move into, since we're on this topic of politics, of course, and talking about the Biden administration, um, the election results for the 2021 election. So it was pretty crazy, of course. Oh. Um, there was like a whole week where we weren't sure who was going to win, and um, things were just kind of in turmoil in the country, and in a way it still is. Um, so just, I guess, just what are your thoughts or opinions on the election results? Yeah, I mean, that was the, I, I remember the 2000 election. That kind of shows my age. And for those of us that maybe don't remember the 2000 election, um, that was also very delayed because we weren't sure of the outcome of the race in the state of Florida. And there were some things about the race in Florida that were strange with like strange ballots and you know, people getting denied to vote and whatnot. Uh, but that was one state. Um, we didn't have a candidate refusing to concede. Al Gore lost the election in 2000, and he did concede that he lost when it became clear that he did. Um, the idea of a sitting president refusing to concede and refusing to acknowledge the outcome of the vote, um, hopefully that doesn't become a precedent. Hopefully that remains an outlier. We've seen a peaceful transition of power, we, at least we had seen it for you know around 240 years, really until this year. And if this becomes a precedent, I think that's very troubling for the stability of our democracy. So I was very disappointed in some of our political leadership for not recognizing the legitimacy of the democratic process. Now, every election has weird things that happen. There's always some small degree of you know, strange ballots or some degree of fraud, but there was no evidence that there was widespread electoral fraud. Just no, there was no evidence that this could have been shifted illegitimately. Um, and so it was disappointing to see leaders not recognizing that and playing into fears about conspiracy theories and wild allegations. And again, I hope that that doesn't become the norm because I think that undermines belief in the legitimacy of our elections. And if you're living in a democracy, that's how we elect our leaders. If you don't believe that elections are valid, that just undermines people's faith in, in the country. And I think that would be unfortunate. So all that to say, I'm glad it's finally over. What were your thoughts about the election? Um, I mean, I was on edge the entire time, um, not specifically because I wasn't sure who was going to win, but more so because I wasn't sure how the citizens of the United States would take that. And of course, we saw how some people took that um, with the Capitol riot and the insurrection that occurred. Um, a few Wednesdays ago. Seems like something crazy has been happening every Wednesday <laughs> so far in 2021. Yep. But um, yeah, we've seen that so far. Um, so actually, what are your thoughts about that, about the Capitol insurrection? Yeah, I, w I watched the, so what was going on that day, of course, was they were counting the electoral college votes. Now that's supposed to be a routine thing. It's supposed to take a couple hours and then they all go home. 
Um, and then sure enough, what happens is a mob invades the Capitol. And I watch, I was glued to my screen. And I'm, uh, I think that's gonna be a day I'll never forget. Um, like I was watching live when Mike Pence, Vice President at the time, Mike Pence was ushered off the floor. They had to, you know, hurry all of these uh, congressional leaders into their offices and into safe spaces. And I just think it's so tragic that there can be so much distrust and suspicion and, and hatred that it can lead people to do that kind of thing, um, to violate a sacred symbol of our democracy, uh, the U.S. Capitol, that hadn't been um, invaded like that since 1812, from when the British a long time ago burned the U.S. Capitol, so over 200 years. And so that was such a sad moment. It's probably a low moment of, of quite a while, um, at least in my political memory. So I was very troubled by it. Um, and I was troubled at a willingness to try to excuse the behavior, like trying to find a way to explain it away or trying to find a way to rationalize it. Um, I feel like as a country, we haven't really come to grips with what that event meant. And I don't feel like I have. I think we'll be, we'll be processing it over the next months and years. It takes a long time to process these kinds of things. Uh, but I don't feel like we've come together as a country around what that event meant. So what were you feeling that day? Um, like you said, I was, I was glued to my phone the entire time. I remember I was sitting in my room and every time like something else happened or someone else tried to climb like the walls of the Capitol, I was like, oh my gosh, like look at what they're doing. And really for me, um, so over the past summer, I participated in the protests which occurred in Louisville, Kentucky. And to see the difference in the treatment of the white supremacists who were at the Capitol and the Black Lives Matter protesters who were peacefully protesting through the streets of downtown Louisville, um, it was horrific, really. It was, it was offensive and horrific. And I think it just really highlights the issues of this country. Um, it shows the problem of policing. I mean, you saw at more and more, um, more and more like things are coming out about what happened that day at the Capitol. And you've seen like how some of the police were in on the insurrection that occurred and they were actually helping some of the white supremacists like get through and telling them where members of the Congress were. Um, and then you look at, um, at, at the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington, D.C., where Donald Trump said, uh, when, the looting starts, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Um, and then he kind of just dismissed the white supremacists who were at the Capitol as if they were doing nothing wrong. Um, so yeah, I think it really just highlights the issues which have been taking place in our nation. And I hope this can be like a, a sort of wake up call for everyone, um, yeah. When I watched the, we haven't talked yet about the impeachment trial, but during the impeachment trial for former President Trump, they showed video clips of the of the mob that was invading the Capitol. And one thing that I noticed, and other people pointed out, is there were some of the of the uh, rioters carrying uh, Blue Lives Matter flags as they were assaulting the police. And I just found that contrast. And again, I I can't quite wrap my head around that. But it just seems so strange that here are these people that at least they say they're on the side, like the protester or the, the mob was saying they're on the side of law and order. But here they were assaulting the police and ransacking our, our capital. So I, I think you're absolutely right that there, this, the contrast there between the response to some of the uh, Black Lives Matter protesters and then the mob, um, the, the difference in response is something that stood out to me and I think a lot of other folks. Yeah. Yeah, I think with that. Um like you mentioned, Blue Lives Matter, and then how they were they were carrying the flags and maybe had like a hat or something, and then they turned around and um, would assault the police officers. I think it kind of shows that Blue Lives Matter wasn't all about um, police officers' lives mattering to them. It was just about Black lives not mattering. Um, so yeah, I wanted to add that. Well, and there's a long history of phrases like law and order being kind of politicized, and that it's it's not simply wanting law and order, that it, it can be sort of a coded message that certain kinds of laws and certain kind of order is, is promoted over other kinds of law and order. And so, yeah, I think you're right that those kinds of messages have a double meaning that some people recognize in different ways. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I guess we can continue to sort of just for a few more moments just to talk about um, the dynamic of white supremacy that we've seen in the country. Um, like, what are your what are your thoughts on that? And just how it's been well, going it's, so far. And I mean, it, we're seeing um, increasing racial short, uh, sorting along political lines, and not just not just along race. Things like education and class matter as well. But we're seeing that the Republican Party is becoming more and more the party of white voters and the Democratic Party becoming the more of a multi-ethnic, uh, multiracial coalition. Um, and I think that's very tr another thing I find troubling is if we start seeing our politics more explicitly organized along racial lines, um, I think that can sort of build this sense of, you know, this kind of this this fear that some white folks have about becoming a, a, you know, potentially a demographic minority. I mean, I think for a lot of white folks, they're very concerned about what the, de the demographic changes we're seeing in the country. And I think part of that fear is what's driving some of this white supremacy and some of this white nationalism that we see evidenced with claims for like building the wall and uh, t this language of taking back our country. Um, I think white supremacy is a, is a part of all that. No, I don't think every person that voted for Trump is necessarily a white supremacist or a white nationalist, of course. Um, but I think that's an aspect of our politics that needs to be recognized. And I don't think we do a good enough job at doing so. Um, I think we tend to undercount the extent that domestic terrorism is largely driven in this country by far right groups. Um, for much of the 2000s, we were concerned about Islamic terrorism, and that certainly is a problem. But in reality, there was a domestic problem that was much closer to home as opposed to groups based in foreign countries around the world. So I, I think we just aren't having the conversation, um, or at least not having the conversation with the right people about how do, we, how do we confront white supremacy and what do we do about it? How do we address the legitimate fears that people might have? if they feel like their economic situation is being undermined because of changes in our economy? Um, how do we address the legitimate fears while at the same time not kind of playing into conspiracy theories um, that drive a lot of this? So yeah, it's a tough question. I certainly haven't wrapped my head around all of it as well. Um, and yeah, what are your thoughts about this this issue? I mean, like you said, it's a tough question. It's always a, um, I guess, sticky topic to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. But I sure. definitely think there hasn't been enough, like it hasn't been taken seriously enough. Um, I mean, you would have thought after the, um, after Dylan Roof shooting up the church, you would have thought that that was enough for them to take it seriously. You would have thought after the, um, the shooter in El Paso who went into the Walmart and just um, shot it up. You would have thought that that was enough. You would have thought that after the Capitol insurrection that that was enough for our government to take it seriously. But um, hopefully within the coming, as more comes out about the insurrection, hopefully um, it'll begin to be taken more seriously and seen as an actual threat that it is. Well, and part of what goes on when we, we you mentioned like Dylan Roof, that's the, that's the uh, young man that killed, I think it was eight parishioners at a AME Church in, in Charleston, South Carolina. I think that was 2014, for the viewers who maybe haven't heard that case. What tends to happen is these things get written off as lone wolf. So Dylan Roof, he was a lone wolf. This gentleman that shot the people in El Paso, I shouldn't say gentleman, but the man who shot the people in El Paso, lone wolf. So there's this tendency to write off right-wing terrorism as this lone wolf individual kind of thing when that's just not the case. They aren't simply lone wolves. I mean, they're getting this information from online resources. They're finding networks of like-minded people through various extremist websites. So there's really no such thing as a lone wolf terrorist. And that's also by design. The people that perpetrate a lot of these ideological beliefs have a something called leaderless resistance, where they purposefully don't organize organizations because those can be infiltrated. Um, they purposefully encourage this kind of so-called lone wolf terrorism because you can't track it. So again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a myth that the Dylan Roofs of the country are really lone wolves as opposed to part of this broader social network of white supremacy and white terrorism. 
Um, now, the challenge with dealing with that is we do have free speech and there's only so much you can do. Uh, but you do see some uh, internet providers not willing to tolerate extremist uh, language on their on their products. Like Parler, the online um, chat service, uh, was kicked off of the Amazon Web Services because Amazon didn't feel that Parler was doing a good enough job at making sure people aren't promoting violence and aren't promoting extremist beliefs. So I think those kinds of steps will limit access to these ideas, but it's not going to get rid of it entirely because there's just there's just too many ways to um, find this kind of extremist information online. Yeah. Um, before we switch gears, while we're on the subject of like social media, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, former President Donald Trump and how he was banned from Twitter. Um, a lot of people, and as you mentioned, we do have free speech. Um, a lot of people believe that that was a violation of his free speech. Um, before I say my thoughts, what are yours? <laughs> well, um, so a lot of people think that free speech means you can never get in trouble for anything you say ever. Um, what free speech refers to is the government can't prosecute you for saying unpopular things. Um, so we can criticize our president, regardless of who it is, and we don't have legal consequences for doing that. The government doesn't prosecute us. Um, free speech doesn't mean that there are never social consequences or also private consequences. But like you can imagine what would happen if you, if someone were to go like, you know, tell off their boss, hey, you're probably going to get fired. Because that's not what free speech means. Free speech means you can say unpopular things and not face political consequences, but it doesn't mean there aren't going to be social and personal consequences. Um, and that's what I think people miss when they talk about former President Trump and Twitter. Twitter can have whatever policies it wants regarding speech because it's a private company. It's not the government. So it's not a it's not a free speech issue for Twitter to decide how it wants to set its uh, its policies regarding how people use its platform. Um, so I, I think that's often missed. So I, so I don't think his free speech rights were violated in, in that sense. So that, that's kind of my take on it. What, do, do you have a sense as well? No, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Like um, Twitter is its own entity. It's not, it has no affiliation with the government. And I know like a lot of times they'll um, ban people who, say things that are false or say things that maybe incite violence. So it's not a matter of um, violating his free speech. It was just going against their guidelines. Um, so yeah. So next thing I want to talk about is, of course, the thing that has been taking up all of our lives for almost a year now. Well, a year now, um, COVID. Um, so I guess we can first just start talking about like the inequalities that we've seen when it comes to COVID. Um, there have been higher rates of brown and black people affected by it. Um, there's less access to vaccines for brown and black people. Um, so what are your thoughts or take on that? Yeah, this has been really uh, you know, amazing, but also you know, sad to see play out. We often, at least, maybe, maybe this is just me, I often think about you know, racial inequities as something that happened like a long time ago, and we've made so much progress as a country since then and whatnot. But we're seeing this play out right now. As you mentioned, um, uh, people of color, including like African Americans, Hispanics, um, uh, American Indians, they have, uh, in some cases, two to three times higher levels of hospitalization and death as a result of COVID. So we're seeing inequities playing out right now, and that's, um, and maybe I'm just a little naive, but that's that's amazing to me that in 2021 we're still seeing these kinds of outcomes. Uh, and so why is it? I think you're right. I think you mentioned like access to health care. We see that there's different levels of access to, to uh, medical facilities. You can see that where, where medical facilities are physically located. They're not always located in places where uh, communities of color can easily access them. Um, I think also socioeconomic status can play into this as well. We know that uh, poverty disproportionately affects communities of color. So I think there's a role of that. Um, so it's, but yeah, it's a kind of a multi-level problem. And it's, again, it's really important that we're seeing this play out right now um, in our in our day-to-day -day lives. So yeah, what, do you, what is your sense about that? Um, I mean, when it comes to health, I feel like there's always been, um, 
there's always been the case where black people, black women, people of color are not taken as seriously as um, Caucasian people and when it comes to what they need and um, the treatment that they need. So I feel like also that could play a part when it comes to COVID-19 and hospital hospitalizations um, mm -hmm. and things like that. Like, I know this may not be relevant exactly, but um, there used to be a belief among doctors that black women felt less pain than white women. And so they were given less, they were given the worst treatment when it came to whatever they needed. Um, so I feel like that definitely plays a part in what we're seeing with COVID. Um, another thing which I wanted to mention was the African-American community's distrust in vaccines. Um, of course, you know, you can you can talk about that. You can go ahead and talk about that if you want to. See. Like the history well, this is, of it. I mean, this is, this is an area I've heard about. I can't speak uh, in terms of expertise on this issue, but um, that's, but that's, that is one thing that I have heard that's among some, uh, some communities of color, there's a skepticism over the government's um, efforts to vaccinate. Part of that having to do with previous experiences. We know of things like the Tuscaloosa project where communities of color were denied medical treatment to see how, um, uh, I think it was, I think, I think it was syphilis, how syphilis would affect um, their lives. And so there, there, you know, there's this legacy of distrust based on uh, experiences either directly or maybe from relatives and family members of uh, mistreatment from the government when they were expecting it to pro be providing legitimate services. So it's, it's, but hopefully the examples of people like Vice President Harris and other leaders within, um, you know, the black community and other, you know, other communities, hopefully seeing their examples of getting the shots will help alleviate some of those um, sources of kind of mistrust over the, over the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, I plan on getting the vaccine as soon as I can. Of course, I'm later in the line, so I'm not rushing it, but um, I do plan on getting it. I'm sure you do, too. Yeah, I certainly will. Now, frankly, I'm not someone who ne who needs it. I'm not a frontline worker. I mean, we are obviously doing this conversation over Zoom or I guess Teams. Um, so I don't need it to the same extent as like a nurse or, a, you know, someone who has to be physically present for their job. But yeah, as soon as I can, definitely I'll, I'll get the vaccine. So yeah, hopefully that's not too long, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about or address? Um, I guess one question I would just kind of throw out comes to mind is, what are you most hopeful for about our country? <laughs> it's a loaded question. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for a lot of things. Um, kind of right now, it's hard to be hopeful with everything sure. that's going on and everything that has happened in the past. But I think especially with the new administration and um, the new uh, Congress and everything that we have, um, I do have hope that racial inequities will get better in the country. Um, I have hope that there will be greater access to health care when it comes to black and brown people and those who need it the most. Um, I have hope that there will be um, less of a less of a division between classes. Um, yeah, I have a lot of hope for a lot of things. I have hope that hopefully soon COVID um, will slow down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of why I asked the question, just because, I mean, between, we, we haven't talked about like the weather situation right now where there's like millions of people without heat. It just seems like all this negative news keeps, like you mentioned before, like every week there seems to be like this new catastrophe. And I, that's the way it can seem, you know? So that's, that's part of the reason why I, I asked, is mainly for my own <laughs> consolation hearing about a beer about hope. But we have seen some good news about COVID lately. The numbers are down. They're only like 60,000 cases a day, which that's incredible that that's good news. But as opposed to last month when it was like several hundred thousand cases a day, 60,000 60, a day or so is, is actually an improvement. So no, I appreciate your, your response to that question. Um, I, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I like your answer. So I'll, I'll take that. Well, I wanna thank you both. Uh, just great dialogue, great conversation. Um, I do plan to get the vaccine as well uh, when it comes out. Um, 
as a, I'm not only a person of color, but I'm also diabetic. So uh, affected just double on that, but very excited about the, the, uh, the hope for the future and what's to come. And uh, just want to appreciate appreciate you both hopping on. Uh, we plan to have many more conversations and dialogues like this. Um, but if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Marino or Milan, you can email me, uh, jpbarnett at camelsville.edu, and I will get those questions to them, and uh, we will respond uh, in our next episode. Uh, but thank you guys. Thank you both for being a part and participating. Appreciate you. These views are of the individuals and not the views of Campbellsville University.